Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of the Church. Pray for us. Our Lady, Queen of the Family. Pray for us. Our Lady, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Our Patron Saints and Guardian Angels. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, there's lots to could be talked about, especially with uh, this being the month of the Rosary. And um, just yesterday, as you know, began the year of Porta Fide, the year of faith that Pope Benedict has called for this whole year, beginning yesterday until November 24th of 2013, the Holy Fathers asked for a special year of grace, uh, a holy year dedicated to the year of faith, uh, wanting to draw attention once again to the importance of the gift of faith that we have received, the gift of faith that we received at baptism, you know, uh, that's a gift. It's not something that you were born with. It's something that was given to you when the Holy Spirit was, uh, came into your soul and made his home at baptism. And that gift of faith is the most important gift that we could ever receive because with that gift of faith, all the other things that we receive from God are dependent upon that faith because as you know, our Lord says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So that supernatural gift of faith that we receive at baptism is an entrance. That's why he says the porta fide, the door of faith. When we receive the gift of faith at baptism, we enter into a different world, another world. We know that we have a natural life, this life that we live in the body and we see things, the physical world, but there's another world that we are meant for, and that's the supernatural life, the life above the natural, the life of God. And that is called supernatural because it's not something that we can acquire on our own. It's, that's why it's called the gift of faith. God has to give it to us. He has to elevate us. And St. Thomas Aquinas used to have this very, it's a very interesting little phrase. He says, man by nature has an end by nature which is beyond his nature. Because we're not meant just for this world alone. There's no such thing as pure nature. Uh, when Adam and Eve were made in the garden by God, they were made in the state of original justice. And that meant that they were created in grace. It wasn't just a natural life they were living. God already created, when he created Adam and Eve, our first parents, he created them in grace. And that is what happened with this, the original sin, is they lost that gift of grace. They lost the state of original justice. All those great gifts that God gave them, uh, you know, they lost immortality, they lost infused knowledge, they now could get sick, they had a weakened will, darkened intellect, unruly passions because of the original sin. And, but they still retained the gift of faith. God still allowed them to believe in him and to know and even gave them that great promise of a redeemer. You know, in Genesis 3.15, I'll put, when he said to the sermon, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and yours. You shall strike at her heel, and she shall crush your head. So mankind was already given at the first, when he messed up in the garden, was already given the promise of the fix, of the, of the one who would restore what our first parents had destroyed by their pride and choosing to listen to the serpent. So our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, has called this year of grace to focus on the gift of faith because he said we live in a time in which we have to kind of go back to the fundamentals, go back to the roots, uh, go back to, to once again we grasp the importance and the necessity of our faith. First of all, that we've received it. Then, you know, that we understand what the faith is so he said, you know, that we should go back and he says, during this year, you should study the catechism. You know, even though as young as you are and you say, well, I've already, you know, learned a lot about the faith. 
even as we get older, we forget. So he's saying, you know, we need to go back and revisit the catechism. The catechism of the Catholic Church, especially the one that Pope John Paul II issued, because he said that really is the catechism of Vatican II, to show that the faith hasn't changed at all. Some people think, you know, that Vatican II, and you were not around by when Vatican II took place. I wasn't even around when Vatican II started. I was born a year later. But, um, you know, that the, the gift of faith and what the church has given to us is always the same. You can read a catechism, the Didache, from the first centuries of the church, from the apostles themselves who wrote, they believe that the Didache is, is something attributed to the, to the apostles themselves. And you read the catechism of the Catholic Church that Pope John Paul II issued, or you read the Catechism of the Council of Trent, you'll find that it's the same teaching. Nothing has changed. And Vatican II did not change or alter anything in, the, in our faith. It just wanted to somehow call to mind what are the issues facing the church in the modern world and how can we take this ancient faith of ours and address these issues? How can we meet the needs of our time? Because that's the importance, is that every age of the church has had special challenges, you might say. And we need to know, you might say, what are the enemies of the faith? What are the challenges of our faith? And how we are to point them out, and then we can address them. One of the things, of course, you know, we can see that there has been a wrong interpretation of what the teaching of the church was, or the intention of Vatican II. And many things happened which caused a lot of confusion which wasn't the, the, um, wasn't the intention or the fault of Vatican II. It was those who had another agenda instead of the one that Christ intended and that the church intended. So we're, we maybe have suffered the effects of that in many ways in that the, the Catholics were so confused that they didn't, weren't able to, to address the issues. And many people, of course, lost their faith or they um, um, decided to water it down. And that's what the Holy Father wants us not to do. That's why he wants us to go back to the Catechism. And he wants us to go back, he says, even go and read the documents of Vatican II yourself. You know, they're not there like the church saying, don't read these. You know, the church didn't issue them and hide them and say, guess what it said. The church wants us to, to read the documents. And Pope... Benedict says, go back and read them. Read them yourself. Don't let somebody else tell you. You might say, somebody else tell you what it says. You go and read it, and then listen to how the popes throughout the ages have explained Vatican II. Pope Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, Pope Benedict, they're the ones who are the true interpreters of Vatican II. Not theologian A or theologian B or sister C or sister D, if they're not thinking what the church, or if they're not teaching what the church is, is saying, you can be confused. And that's why the Pope said, we need to read all these things with the mind of the church. And how do we have the mind of the church? Well, we listen to the Holy Fathers who have been given that grace to tell us what Vatican II means. We have all the encyclicals that have been issued by the Pope since Vatican II. One of the best, uh, you know, one of the things you hear after Vatican II was that, you know, Our Lady wasn't important. You know, devotion to Mary was considered by Vatican II not to be important, and so everybody kind of threw it out. Well, Pope John Paul II issued a very important encyclical called Redemptoris Mater, Mother of the Redeemer, when he shows that, no, the church didn't throw Our Lady out. Matter of fact, it grew even importance of trying to focus on what her role was in her relationship to the church. And even after Vatican II, I invoked her before we began this talk. Paul VI wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, uh, get the impression that Our Lady wasn't important, in that he had Our Lady, uh, he gave her that special title in a special consistory, or all the bishops before they left Vatican II, the last thing they did was proclaim Our Lady Mother of the Church. Because he wanted people to know that Our Lady is very much at the heart of the Church. You know, you can't have a family without a mother. And the family of God has a mother, and she's very much at the heart of the church. So that he wanted to focus that, no, the Vatican II is not saying that Our Lady is not important. Matter of fact, he had a special event to point it out. Before the bishops left 
Vatican II, before they closed the doors of, this, of that special council, they proclaimed Our Lady as Mother of the Church. And um, Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Redemptoris Mater, Mother of the Redeemer, wants to point out what is the beauty of Our Lady and her role, as we like to refer to her in our order, and as even before Vatican II, as the co-redemptrix. She who is with the Redeemer at the foot of the cross, Mother of the Redeemer. What is her role in our salvation? And that it has an essential role, an essential role along with her son, subordinate to Christ, but very important for our salvation. So we need to read Vatican II within line of the tradition. The Pope has said, you know, one of the things is that people read Vatican II isolated from this tradition and this hermeneutic, he said, of continuity. That, you know, our faith spans back to, to the early centuries, to Christ when he said to Peter, you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And there's a continuity that if you see everything in light of the, what has proceeded from that, all the different councils, all the different papal and encyclicals, you will have a clear understanding of what this continuity is. And if you read that, you don't have to maybe read everything, but the catechism is where you will find, you might say it all sum summarized, and you get the essentials of what you need to know. And then you can go and branch off and, and examine more what is the, you know, the fullness and richness of this faith that we have received at baptism. Because the Holy Father says it's not just knowing, it's not just an intellectual pursuit, the faith that we have. It's also a matter of the heart. And he says that's where the faith has to really, if we have to embrace the faith with our hearts. It's not just that we know that, yes, the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or that um, the teaching of the church about contraception or marriage is, you know, the sacramental nature of marriage. It's one thing that we know what that means. It's another thing that we embrace it, that we believe it. And believing is more than just knowing. Believing is like saying, okay, I embrace it, I will to, to accept this, and I will take it to my heart. That if I believe something, then I will also defend it. I will also share that with somebody else. You know, I can know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, excite me about wanting to share that with somebody else. Except when they're counting my money out at the <laughs> bank, you know. But... But when I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that he came and died for my sins, and that he has established his church for my salvation and to get everybody to heaven, the reason why we call the church the Catholic Church, and our faith the Catholic faith, because Catholic means it's universal. It means it's meant for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. There's not a person on the face of the earth who isn't meant to be, or isn't disposed to be, Catholic. Because as St. Augustine said, man by nature is Christian. He's by nature disposed to the Christian faith. And I would say that even more, to be more specific, because what St. Augustine meant by Christian, there was only one faith when St. Augustine lived, it's the Catholic faith. Everybody you meet, even though they may not agree with what the Catholic Church teaches, because of some ignorance they may have, or they may have some moral they don't want to live the faith because they don't want to be imposed upon because they think the church is going to, the faith is going to restrict them in some way. What they really don't understand is that the faith is really, the mo they're meant to be Catholic. They're by nature disposed to the Catholic faith because God meant it for everybody. He wants everybody to be happy. And to, for them to be happy, to be like Adam and Eve before they fell, they have to have this grace. They have to have this supernatural life with God and its fullness. God doesn't just want you to have nine-tenths of the truth or five-tenths of the truth. He wants you to have all of the truth. He says, the truth shall make you free. The truth will make you free to that degree. If you have the fullness of the faith, it's going to make you fully free. If you only have nine-tenths of the faith or five-tenths or one-tenth, well, you're going to be free to the degree that you know the truth. But God wants everybody to have that. So that's why, if it's the Catholic faith, and it's meant for everybody, that means that not only for you to have it for your own happiness, it's meant for your neighbor, for his happiness too. 
And so we should, if we really believe this, we really understand the nature of what we have received at baptism, then we will be like the apostles who went out to all the world to what? They went out to spread the faith. You know, our Lord even gave them that mandate. He says, go out to all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He didn't go out to all the world and say, just, you know, whatever you like, you know, if you like to be Buddhist or you like to be this, or you like to be in the dark, you know, that's not what they went out there. They went out there to teach them that there's no salvation in anyone other than Jesus Christ and His church. And they wanted them to embrace that. And they wanted them to know that. And that was the thing that they were willing to die for. And our Holy Father wants us to, you might say, revivify that spirit, that same Holy Spirit that vivified the apostles, is the same Holy Spirit that's still active today in the church. But we have to dispose ourselves by being open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. And you young people, you're getting to the point where you're going to have to decide, what does God want from me? You know, what is God's will? What does he want me to do with my life? Because you're the future of the church. God is going to work through you. And therefore, you need to pray. You need to ask God for the grace to know his will and the grace to do his will. That's where that, you know, that aspect of knowing and then for going out and doing something with that which you know God wants you to do. So I would encourage you as you go along to begin, if you haven't already, to ask God in prayer, to ask especially Our Lady, the Mother of God, what is it that she wants you to do? You know, we have different vocations in the church. Do you know what those, the three main vocations in the church are? The states of life. Have you ever heard of that? You know what it means to be a state of life? Not the state of Indiana or the state of California. The state of life. There are three types of life that God can call you to, to live. What's one of those states? What's one of the ways you can live your adult life? Yes. Marriage. Marriage. What's yes. another one? Single. And there's one other one. One that many of them don't want to look at. They're afraid that it might ask them too much. Yes. Religious life. Religious life. Priesthood, religious life. So we have married life. We have the married state. We have the single state. And we have the religious state or the consecrated state. Priesthood and religious life. Those are the three vocations. Those are the three, what's a vocation means from vocare, to call. God is saying, hello, I have a job for you. And you say, what? I can't hear. <laughs> or do you say, yes, Lord. Like you remember the t Eli and the... Uh, Eli and, and was Samuel, I think it was, in the temple. God was calling Sam, Samuel, I think, no, Eli, it was Eli. I can't remember who it was. One of them was being called. And he went to him and said, you called me, sir. And he says, no, I didn't call. You go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. And then he came Samuel, to the... Samuel, Samuel. Yeah, and so Eli said, go back to sleep. And he said, I didn't call you. And then finally the third time... Eli said, it's the God who's calling you. Next time he, you hear him say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Or here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. That should be a prayer that you should be saying now. And should be as, as young as you, even if you're six years old. Once you realize that God is there, you can be saying to God, okay, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Because every day we have to do his will. That's where we know that we're pleasing God when we do His will. But there's something, at a certain point in your life, you're going to realize, God wants me to do something. He's calling me to live in a certain way. Either He's calling me to married life, He's either calling me to the religious life, or He's calling me to the single life. Because whatever state of life He's calling you to, that's where you're going to be happy. You know? That's what uh, a lot of people think. Well, we're all meant to be married. Well, no, he doesn't call everybody to marriage. And maybe that's why a lot of people aren't happy being married because they didn't choose the right vocation. But they need to know and they need to pray. You need to ask God, what do you want me to do? And when you ask God, he'll be more, he's already been, you might say, he's already been calling you. He's called you from the time you were baptized. 
He already has your vocation. You know, God isn't, you know, He's outside of time. He knows what's going to make you happy. And He has a special gift for you. And within that gift of faith is also your vocation. How you're going to live that out in your state in life. So it's important that you pray and ask God. It may be marriage that He's calling you to. But then you want to be a, a Catholic when you're married. You want to live according to the way the church says you should live as a married couple. You want to follow the teaching of the church as a married couple. Because to the degree you follow the teaching of the church, you will be happy. That means that the church is teaching about marriage, that you be open to children, that it's till death do us part. And all the things that you know, the church teaches about marriage, because the church is not a human institution, it's a divine institution. God speaks through these men and through the ages, through these men who have been given the grace to be bishops and successors to the apostles, to teach us how we are to be happy in the married state, in the single state, and in the religious state. And you know, we see many people like Mother Teresa, John Paul II, and saints of our modern time. We're going to have Catherine, Blessed Catherine Tekawita, and uh, Marianne Cope, you know, being canonized this, this month. So we see that God gives that grace of the vocation, along with their sanctity, is already there within that vocation. So whatever state in life God's calling you to, He's calling you to be holy. That's another one of the biggest things that came out of Vatican II, is that we all have the universal call to holiness. God wants each and every one of us to be a saint. Do you think sainthood is fun? You don't think sainthood, being a saint is fun? But does that mean you think that being a sinner is fun? No. Well, one has to be fun. And when I say fun, I mean, do you think the saints were happy? Or are happy? Do you think that Catherine, Blessed Catherine Tekawita, John Paul II, Mother Teresa, do you think they were happy? Happy doing what they were doing? Sure. Because sanctity is what makes us pleasing to God. And it's what it's made... It's what's for us. It's, it's, as I said, we're made to know the truth. And so if you're doing what God wants you to do, you'll be happy doing that, whatever that is. You know that, and so you say, well, we, maybe we have the wrong understanding of what sanctity is if we don't think that sanctity is, is something that's going to be making us happy. But the saints were very joyful. Even the saints who suffered for Christ, when they were suffering for Christ, they weren't laughing at the time, but they were still happy to know that this is what God wanted them to do, and they were happy to give that witness. And they're happy for sure now in heaven because they have received, they have finally obtained what they wanted, what God wanted for them. They now possess eternal life with God. Now, heaven is going to be a place of great joy. We can't understand what that means, probably fully, because it's the eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has prepared for us. But it obviously is going to be much more enjoyable than the greatest movie or the greatest party you ever had in this world. It's going to be far more satisfying. So, uh, and it's going to be where everybody loves one another, where there's no hatred, animosity, selfishness, you know, just to imagine that, where everybody loves one another and they're concerned for the other individual above themselves and they all love God, we can't even imagine a place like that. You know, because we don't, we don't see it here in one sense. We see a little faint image of it in the church or sometimes in our families when we have a moment where everybody is peaceful and doing what God wants. But it should be already starting here on earth, the kingdom of God. Heaven is meant to begin here. And that's why we see the gift of faith. It's so important because already with the gift of faith, the seed of heaven is planted in your soul. Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity said, When I received baptism, I received heaven into my soul. Because God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit came and dwelled Dwell in my soul by grace. So, you know, this is, um, 
those are those profound mysteries and the, the things that the saints have grasped. So that, uh, you know, we want to, to look to them and imitate them because the people that, you know, the Hollywood holds out to us and the TV, those people are not really happy living that way. If they were really happy, they wouldn't have to be, they wouldn't be using drugs, they wouldn't be doing things which are not pleasing to God because they're trying to find God in the wrong places. Everybody wants to be happy. That's a given. There's not a person on the face of the earth who doesn't want to be happy. You ask anybody, your neighbor, you know, anybody who you think probably doesn't, you probably think, well, they don't really know much, but I'll ask them. You ask anybody, do you want to be happy in life? And they'll say, yes. If they say no, there's something wrong with them because it's, it's inbuilt. We all want to be happy. We all want to be satisfied. We all want to have that which we think we're meant to possess. But the thing we're meant to possess is first and foremost God. And we have to strive for it in a way that we're going to achieve that. If we try and find it in something less than God, we'll never be happy. Some people try to find it in money, power, lust, whatever it may be. But they're not happy. Because material things cannot satisfy this longing in our heart that is for the infinite. When you remember when I said St. Thomas said man by nature has an end by nature which is beyond his nature? It means that there's nothing on this earth that can replace or fill the little God, the little God hole in your soul. You know, that only God can fill that spot. So, let, uh, you know, that's something that we need to um, pray about. And, you know, but you won't be happy by jettisoning your Catholic faith. And as young people, you know, you're going to have a lot of challenges in the world. They're going to say, oh, you'll be happy doing this. Don't listen to the church. Listen to us. We're the smartest people on the face of the earth. When you hear someone say, listen to us, we know better than the church, you should run in the opposite direction. Because that's the same person who said to Adam and Eve, oh, God wasn't, he doesn't really mean that. You don't need to listen to him. Listen to me. You can hear the little hiss from hell when you hear someone say they know more than the church. Uh, and that's not going to be the place you'll find happiness. But... Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, we're in the month of the Rosary, October, as you know, and tomorrow is October 13th. Does anybody know the significance of October 13th? Yes. Well, it's, it's the, one of the important dates of Fatima. I guess the Feast of Fatima, Our Lady's Feast, is May 13th, when she began her apparitions at Fatima. But October 13th, 1917, something very Powerful happened on that day. Does he, do you know? Those, this miracle of the sun took place where the sun almost looked like it was going to come and crash into the earth. And at that time, while the sun was dancing in the sky at Fatima, Our Lady showed the children the vision of her, uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel with the Christ child, St. Joseph with the child Jesus, and Our Lady of Sorrows. And uh, that's what the children saw while the people saw the, da- the sun dancing in the sky. And they thought they were all going to die. A hundred thousand people witnessed this miracle. And um, when Sister Lucy was asked about, you know, this great miracle of the sun, she said that, you know, that Our Lady wanted to, well, first of all, she said she would work this miracle to show the proof of what she had to say at Fatima was so important that people would realize God does not work a miracle for 100,000 people. For them to just say, oh, that's private revelation. I don't need to worry about it. It was just for the children. No. As one priest said, that Fatima, because of this public miracle, prophesied months before that was going to take place on that day, and 100,000 people witnessed, was to show forth that the message of Fatima was meant for everybody to take it to heart. And uh, Pope John Paul II even in his uh, letter on the rosary that he issued in 2003. You know, he issued a, uh, an apostolic letter on the importance of the rosary. Now, isn't it interesting? We're in the 21st century. 
where everybody thinks we become so sophisticated, and he's saying that we need to return to the praying the rosary. He had this to say, and I just want to share this with you because I think it's going to help summarize much of what we said already. He said, a number of historical circumstances also make a revival of the rosary quite timely. First of all, we need to implore from God the gift of peace. The rosary has many times been proposed by my predecessors and myself as a prayer for peace. At the start of a millennium which began with the terrifying attacks of 9-11, a millennium which witnesses every day in numerous parts of the world fresh scenes of bloodshed and violence, to rediscover the rosary means to immerse oneself in contemplation of the mystery of Christ who is our peace since he made the two of us one and broke down the dividing wall of hostility. How did Christ make the two of us one? How did he bring about peace when he broke down these walls that separated us from God and from one another? Because he died on the cross. That's called the redemption. Or one of the old English words was atonement. You've heard of that word atonement, but if you take atonement and you break it down, it's at one -ment. That's how God made us one again with him and with one another by his death on the cross. So consequently, one cannot, our Holy Father says, consequently, one cannot recite the rosary without feeling caught up in a clear commitment to advancing peace, especially in the land of Jesus, still much sorely afflicted and so close to the heart of every Christian. So he's saying that when we pray the rosary, we are caught up into the mystery of Jesus' life with Our Lady. And that, you know, his life, his whole life was meant to make us one with God. From the time he came into this world until the time he died and rose again, his whole purpose was to bring us peace, to make us at one with the Father. So he says, that he goes on to say, our Holy Father, a similar need for commitment and prayer arises in relation to another critical t contemporary issue, the family, the primary cell of society, increasingly menaced by forces of disintegration on both the ideological and practical planes, so as to make us fear for the future of this fundamental and indispensable institution and, with it, for the future of society as a whole. The revival of the rosary in Christian families within the context of a broader pastoral ministry to the family will be an effective aid to countering the devastating effects of this crisis typical of our age. So he's saying, and he even goes on to quote in there, the family that prays together stays together. So as a family, you know, I think that the Pope is encouraging us that we need to pray the rosary. Not just say it so quickly that we get it done, but to really contemplate to look at the, the mysteries of our Lord's life as Our Lady did when she was alive. She pondered everything in her heart. And that we, if we take some time every day as a family and pray together, that that will help obtain many graces to save us and spare us from a lot of trials and difficulties in this life. Because as you know, the family has, your family, has many attacks against it every day from the culture of death, from the culture of hedonism, all these different isms out there that want to snare you and take you and say, don't listen to the church, listen to us. And we're so subtly, you know, uh, evangelized by these other voices that we need to always touch base with God every day in prayer, and especially the family rosary, because Our Lady, one of her titles is the destroyer of all heresies. She's the destroyer of all falsehood. And there's a lot of falsehood out there in our day and age. She doesn't destroy the heretics. She wants them to be converted. But she does want to destroy heresy. The falsehoods, the lies. Because those lies are not going to lead her children back to God. To her. So she's like a protective mother. She doesn't want her children to go astray. She doesn't want them to be lied to. And so she's out there trying to make sure that we stay on the right path. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I think that one of the things, if you don't pray it as a family yet, the rosary, I'd encourage you to say, well, all my kids are 
to that age where they don't want to pray with, together. Well, I say if you eat together, you should pray together. And that this is something that every family should be doing, especially now. With all the trials and the difficulties we are facing and with, with the upcoming election, we need to pray as a family. St. Louis de Montfort says, he had a little writing in his Secret of the Rosary called A Better Way to Pray. He said, when you pray a rosary with, by yourself, you get the merit for one rosary. He said, when you pray the rosary, it's, he said it's the law of public prayer. When you pray the rosary with five people or 50 people, do you know how, much, how many rosaries you get the merit for when you pray with a group? You get the merit of how many people are praying that rosary. So if you're praying with five people, you get the merit for five rosaries. If you're praying with 500 people, you get the merit for 500 rosaries. Because he said that that is how public prayer works. We're all bound together, this solidarity that we have when we come to pray together. He said that sometimes our prayer isn't so good. And he said, you know how to get rid of chaff. You mix it in with good wheat. And he said, somebody else in the group may be much more zealous, more fervent in their prayer than, than you are. So he said, you attach your prayers to theirs, and their merit will become also part of your merit. And uh, so he said, that it's, when, you're, when you're just one person praying, it's like the devil can break it because it's just one little strand, one little like straw. He said, but when you're praying with a hundred people or with five people, it's like a group of them put together, it's much more strong. He can't break that as easily. And so he's encouraging to pray as a family, and especially with little children whose prayers are very powerful before God because of the innocence. And, in, and as you pray as a family, what is the family called in, uh, in the church? It has another name for it. It's called the domestic church. That means that every church there should be something what coming from that. If it's a domestic church, it means it should be a place of prayer. So, we need to pray as a family. And the rosary because the church is always turned. We celebrated what last week? Our Lady the Rosary. Because why? When Christendom was under attack, it turned to the rosary and asked Our Lady to come to our aid. Well, the family is being under attack by many other, not Turks, not men carrying swords, but carrying something far more evil, and that is evil ideas, falsehood, lies, which can do much more to destroy the family than someone who comes to the door with a gun. Both are very evil, but one is much more subtle because they can also take you to hell with them with evil ideas. And so we need to arm ourselves as a family. We need to pray together. That's such a powerful bond. And Pope John Paul II says that many of the evils that are facing the family, they can be avoided. Because what do we need first and foremost? We need God's grace. And sometimes Our Lady will arrange things and her providential care will spare you from something which somebody else, because they didn't pray, they didn't ask, didn't receive. And so you may be spared a lot of the evils of this age because you prayed and asked Our Lady. And she, I remember the story of John, St. John Marie Vianney. It's not related to the rosary per se, but it's still about Marian devotion. And he said a young lady came to him for confession. And um, after she went to confession, St. John Marie Vianney said, Do you know, he said, I want to share something with you. He said, you went to a dance and you noticed there was a very handsome young man there at the dance, and you wanted to dance with him, but he ignored you. He danced with all the other young ladies at the dance, but he wouldn't dance with you. And he said, you were quite disheartened by that. He said, well, yes, I was. And he said, and you noticed when he went out of, of the room, after the dance was over, he left, you could see flames of fire coming from his shoes, and you thought you were seeing things. He said, yes. He said, I did see flames of fire, and I thought, um, what am I I must be seeing things. He said, well, that young man was a demon in disguise, and he danced with all the people there who were in mortal sin. But because you had your scapular on, he wouldn't go near you because of that sacramental. So we can see that in one sense, Our Lady's loving protection was over this young lady, sparing her from being exposed to some evil because she listened and did something, followed the teaching of the church, 
practice the devotion to Our Lady that Our Lady has asked for us to do throughout the ages, to wear her scapular. Now, Our Lady came from Fatima and said in 1970, pray the rosary every day for peace. Now, do we do that as a family? You know, if we were to do that, just think how many things Our Lady's loving protection would put over your family, over your parish, because Our Lady asked for the rosary because, as Sister Lou said, she knew that not everybody could go to Mass every day because of their schedule, because of their, of their difficulties of their life. They couldn't go to Mass every day. But everybody, no matter what state in life, no matter how old or how big, could pray the rosary every day, at least five decades. So whether you're a young person going to school, you have so many... People, you know, your peers tell you one thing, you see bad example, or you hear things that are so contrary sometimes to what you're raised at. If you're not praying, if you're not staying close to Our Lady and doing what she says, you'll be misguided. You might even be tempted to go along with, with the bad example or the other ideas out there that are contrary to what the church teaches. Now, being homeschooled doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be spared that. You're going to go out into the world and you're going to have to be able to discern good from evil, right from wrong. And hopefully your parents have given you a good foundation. But you know there's always the temptation, the lure of evil. And if you don't pray, you might be lured into that. You have to pray and ask for the grace that Our Lady will help you to always listen to the right voice. So, you know, with all that we've talked about, you know, the year of faith... I think has to be a Marian year as well because she is the one who had the faith. And when we talk about the faith of the church, what is the faith of the church? Where did the faith of the church come from? It's a gift from God, but who was the first one who exercised the gift of faith? Well, Jesus didn't have to have the gift of faith because he was God. He knew he was. The one who exercised first the gift of faith was Our Lady because she had to believe what the Lord said to her. Even St. Elizabeth said to her, Blessed are you who believe that the Lord's words to you would be fulfilled. And that on that first Saturday after our Lord was crucified, on Good Friday, who remained faithful to believing that Jesus was going to rise from the dead? Only Our Lady. Because all the others were disheartened, were thrown into disbelief, or were just, how, how is this a victory, you know? This is such the worst day of our life. That Friday, that's what they thought. But Our Lady said no. She remained faithful. She didn't go to the tomb looking for her son because she knew he wouldn't be there. And how was she trained? How did our Lord teach her that he would? Of course, he told her many times, like he told his apostles, I will suffer, die, and rise on the third day. But he trained her earlier when he was 12 years old, when she lost him. And St. Joseph and her went searching for him. You know, they went looking to their in-laws or their friends, family, whatever, cousins. They couldn't find him. Finally, they found him on the third day. Where did they find him? In the temple. And what did he say to Our Lady? Why did you go looking for me? Did you not know I'd be about my father's business or in my father's house? No matter what translation you use... He was encouraging her to know that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. And that he wasn't lost. And she didn't need to worry. And she said that she pondered all these things in her heart. She probably said, St. Joseph, we've got to go figure out what did he just say there? You know? So 20 years later, 21 years later, when he was dying on the cross, and they put him in the tomb, Our Lady didn't go looking for him because she knew that three days later, she would find him. He would come to her. That she hadn't, he'd be about his father's business. It was all part of the father's plan that he die at Calvary. And that he suffer. And that it was all part of his plan that she should also suffer with him. And so, although it was an excruciating, terrible sorrow, terrible event, no one would ever want to witness that, yet she knew by faith that God's word would be fulfilled. And so the faith of the church is Our Lady's faith. 
because she remained faithful. And she is the virgin made church that St. Francis always used to pray because she is the one who maintained the faith of the church in a time when no one else believed. And that, you know, that's why we celebrate her every Saturday. Saturday is the day of Our Lady because that's the day we always call to mind that there was one person who remained faithful to God in the worst time of history. And the church has a very, hum it's kind of a humorous thing. It calls the Friday in which our Lord died. It doesn't call it the worst Friday or bad Friday. What does it call it? Good Friday. Because of Our Lady's faith and because it learned that even in the midst of trial and difficulty, God, if we're faithful to God, we will always be on the right side. And so we need to have that kind of faith today. That we know that no matter how bad things may seem to be, if we remain faithful to God, God will always bring about the right thing for his people. And uh, I think what Pope Benedict is wanting to do is once again to remind us of our faith, the importance of faith, the importance of sharing it, and the importance of faith being lived out today. And that we should not, as our Lord said to his disciples, be not afraid to live our faith today. It's many challenges, but yet there is much fruit that will come if we remain faithful to God. And so we have to know our faith and live our faith. And we have this opportunity during this year of faith to do so. And, and there's many graces being offered to us during this year. You know, a year of, uh, when the Holy Father calls for a special year to focus on something, it means that there's many graces being given at this time. And the, the graces that are being given at this time have to do with faith. So if you think, my faith isn't very strong, or I don't know my faith, now is the time to seize the opportunity to make use of the graces that God is giving you. Don't wait for someone else to take you by the hand and lead you. Go and seek out. Ask your guardian angel, ask Our Lady, how can I grow in my faith during this year? And help me to know what God wants me to do. And that I can be like Our Lady and say, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord's words to her would be fulfilled. That's for each and every one of us. So, any questions you have or something you want to be answered or that you'd like to be um, talked about that maybe I didn't touch upon? Yes. Whatever. Really? Whatever. Okay. Um, I just know that I think your words are just, it needs to be shared with more mm -hmm. people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, um, in Jasper, they're starting um, 33 days of the consecration. Sure. For of Our Lady, Lady. St. Louis de Montfort. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. to help other people to, sure. to not only understand it, but then after you do the consecration to live it on a daily basis. What that really means every moment of every day, being consecrated, mm -hmm. sure. not just... But could you give just a very brief overview of um, the consecration and what it means like to Jesus through Mary? Um, well, St. Louis de... St. Lord de Montfort had one way of living out consecration to Our Lady. He had that to Jesus through Mary. St. Maximilian Colby was another saint of the church, another Marian saint who also grasped that there's this grace that has been with the church from the apostles, this idea of consecration to Our Lady. It's not something that just sprang up with St. Louis or with St. Maximilian. It's something that's been there throughout the deposit of our faith from, from, from our Lord himself who said from the cross, Behold your mother. That's where we were first all consecrated to Our Lady, is at baptism. Because when you became a child of God, you couldn't become a child of God without also becoming a child of Our Lady. So inherently, you might say implicitly, in everybody's con baptismal consecration, 
there's a consecration to Our Lady because we've been given to her. But some want to make that more explicit, that behold your mother that our Lord said from the cross, they want to take her into their home like St. John and make that more, more, more lived out, more explicitly their taking Our Lady into their home. Not just that they say, well, it's there. They want to call to focus that it's a very important, it's an essential part of living out my Catholic faith is the Marian aspect. Even Paul VI said after Vatican II, and many people don't realize he said this, he said it's impossible. You cannot be a Christian without being Marian. That's a pretty strong statement. So throughout the ages, people have understood that since we've been given to Our Lady, and Our Lady has been given to us by Christ himself, we want to live out this consecration. St. Louis de Montfort said that since Christ came to us through Our Lady, we return to him through Our Lady. St. Maximilian Colby had a nice little scientific formula. He said, you know, in science we say for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. You know, if I punch you, the force going that way is the equal and opposite to the force going, it's coming back to me. Well, he says that there's a law in nature that's equal to that as well. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If Jesus came to us through Mary, how do we return to Jesus but through Mary? So that's how he looked at it. But it's important because... Why do we want to consecrate ourselves to Our Lady? Because there's this mutual exchange that takes place at consecration. We, want, we give everything we have to Our Lady. And of course, she gives that to Jesus. You know, Our Lady doesn't keep it to herself. For St. Maximilian Kolbe, he just said consecration to Our Lady. He didn't even say consecration to Jesus through Mary. He said because of her immaculate conception, to give yourself totally to Our Lady is to give yourself totally to God because the two have the same will. Our Lady's will and God's will are the same. So it doesn't mean that Our Lady's God, but she's so much united to God by that grace of her immaculate conception that her will was never at all opposed to God's will. That's why in Genesis 3.15, already the immaculate conception is prophesied in that statement, that prophecy from God. Why? Because he says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and yours. What does it mean to be enmity? means they'll be always butting heads, they'll always be at odds. Well, that means that if they're always going to be at enemies, that means that at no point did Our Lady ever say yes to sin. Because when you say yes to sin, at that moment you become, in a certain sense, an ally of the devil. But this woman and the serpent will always be at odds, at enmity. And so... Because Our Lady's will is God's will, to give yourself totally to her, give everything you have to her, and Our Lady gives it to God. But everything Our Lady has, she gives to us. We receive, St. Louis de Montfort says, you receive her faith, her hope, and her charity. Mystically, in some way, she shares that in a personal way through her through her maternal mediation, as Pope John Paul II says, she gives you everything she has that she wants for you. So we end up being much richer for it. Only thing that we can really give Our Lady that we that is ours is our sins. And St. Maximilian Coy says, you even give Our Lady your sins because she'll purify you of them. So we give everything we have to Our Lady and she gives us everything that she has. That's that mutual exchange. We become Our Lady's property, as St. Maximilian Colby says, her possession. And then we, in one sense, possess Our Lady. And in that way, that's why we want to do that, because St. Maximilian Colby says, and all the other Marian saints said, Our Lady is the quickest, surest, and easiest way to God. And you know, we're always looking for easy ways. We like easy things. We're always looking for an easy way. Well, then we should consecrate ourselves to Our Lady because it doesn't mean that it's going, to, you know, it's going to be much easier to get to heaven with Our Lady than without her. Well, and there's so, there are so many evil spirits who are trying to trick sure. us. Sure. But if, we're put, if Mary is in a sense our mother and she shares that with us, who's the one person the devil can't even 
Well, she's always going to be, remember also our lady's always going to take a personal interest. She's going to give you the graces. Now you have to respond to them. That, you know, she's going to give you the opportunity to, like this young lady at the dance or whatever, she's going to guide and lead and direct you as long as you are open and, and, and obey that grace. She's going to give you actual graces to, to, to not do this or to do that. You know, you may say, I was denied an opportunity to do something. Well, in God's providence, Our Lady is the, is the mistress of history. Maybe the reason why you weren't given that, what you thought you needed or deserved, was a good reason why you didn't get it. And you'll know that maybe later on in life. But I think that what the consecration to Our Lady is that it becomes a mutual exchange. But also you have to trust and put everything you have into her hands. And then you don't just sit back and act like a... a a lump. You know, you allow Our Lady to move and use you. And you become attentive. You pray to her. And I think that, you know, praying the rosary every day, that's where you get your marching orders. She'll inspire you. She'll guide you. She'll direct you. But you have to be praying to her and asking her for that grace. Um, and it'll be, you'll be much richer for it. You'll, as St. Maxine Colby says, you'll arrive at a higher level of sanctity because of consecrating yourself to Our Lady than if you did it without her. Because you really can't do it without her. No one can be a saint without Our Lady. Even St. Maxine Colby says, all the saints in heaven are Marian. And the great saints, he said, all the saints in heaven had, great, had devotion to Our Lady and the great saints had great devotion. So if you want to get to heaven and you want, all the saints have said the surest way to know that you're going on the right path is devotion to the Mother of God. And I think that's why our Lord gave us all to her at the foot of the cross because he didn't want his cross to be in vain for us. He wanted to make sure that we really benefited from what he was doing at Calvary. And so he said, Mom, I'm giving them all to you because first he gave us to her. He didn't say, John, behold your mother first. He said, woman, behold your son. And then he said, son, behold your mother. So Our Lady has, first and foremost, her priority is to look out for us. And so you're by saying, I want to be on your mantle, Mary. I want to be truly your servant. Because I know that to be your servant is to be the best servant of Christ. You know, our Protestant brothers and sisters, when they read the Gospel of John, and they go to the wedding feast of Cana, and they hear Jesus, you know, woman, what to me, to thee? And she says, do whatever he tells you. The Protestants say, well, well I don't need to listen to her because he, she says, do whatever he tells you. I only listen to Jesus, is what they'll tell you. So they think Our Lady has no importance in their life because she says, do whatever he tells you. So I don't need to listen to her, I just need to listen to Jesus. But they forget at the end of the Gospel of John, what does he say? He says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. So, it's like a circular equation. She says, do whatever he tells you. He says, behold your mother. Do whatever he tells you, behold your mother. Do whatever he tells you, behold your mother. You can't get out of the loop. So, pay attention. You know, why do they only listen to one thing he says? They forget he said something at the end before he died, which is even probably more important. You won't really benefit from the wedding feast of Cana if you don't follow what he said at Calvary. So, that's important, and I think that's a good sign in your parish that there are people making the consecration to Our Lady. Because... She's starting, Father, but we started mm -hmm. praying. I think some of um, it's just very exciting. Mm -hmm. just sure. Well, our lady's going to get, get her foot in the door and some more souls, and she's going to use them. If they allow themselves, if they really take it seriously, what they're doing. You know, they're going to become very powerful instruments in God's hands. You know, it's, there's a little movie out. It's produced by children, or actually children are all the actors in it. It's called The War of the Vendée. It's the story of the French Revolution as you know, which was very much anti-church and anti-God. It was very atheistic. There was only one province of all of it, France that resisted the atheistic and um, anti-church 
uh, forces of France with, a, with an effectiveness. And that was the Vendée, a province that was kind of a rural area. It wasn't much considered of any importance. But they're the only ones that put up a stiff resistance to the French Revolution, which was anti-God. And that was the area, the Vendée was where St. Louis de Montfort preached total consecration to Our Lady. That was the area that he was a missionary. And so you, he was dead by the time the French Revolution took place, but he had so inculcated in the people love for Our Lady, love for the church, love for their faith, that they were willing to, to take up arms and resist evil when it came. And they were very effective. They, for a long time, they kept a, a much greater force at bay and, and frustrated their efforts. But the people, many of them died as martyrs and died in defending their faith. Many of you have seen the movie, you know, For Greater Glory, how the, the Catholics in Mexico, you know, strong devotion that they had, love for the church, uh, was in fostered in them. Our Lady of Guadalupe, you know, that uh, they were willing to lay down their lives for the truth. And I think that's something that we need to understand, that Our Lady is the one who's going to crush the head of Satan. And we need to be with her. You know, St. Maximilian Kobe says, just as the devil can possess a soul, even more so can Our Lady and ought to possess a soul. And that's why he said, you become Our Lady's possession when you consecrate yourself to her. And um, to be her possession is to be God's. You know, some people have this property of Pope Benedict or property of some school or whatever. Well, really, on our souls, written on there in indelible ink, is when we're baptized as property of God or property of Our Lady because we have been claimed for them. And when we do something and say we don't want to serve God, we want to rather serve the devil, we are saying, well, I don't want to be the property of God. You want to give yourself to someone who's much more, less than what we are made for. It's like giving a treasure, casting swine, uh, pearls before swine. The, the devil is a swine. We've been given the great pearl, a prize, that faith. When we reject it, we cast that to the devil, to that pig that he is. And we lose that great pearl. So when we can get it back, of course, with confession. So stay close to the sacraments, too, during this year. Because those are the, the, um, those are the fountains of grace that we receive. So Holy Eucharist, confession, that will continue to increase that gift of faith that you received at baptism. So any other questions or comments? You're here today to pray, I'm sure, too, right? Oh, yeah. So you're going to go up and pray the rosary path, I'm sure, and you'll see the... See the sure. Well, you'll see the new meditations and the new Stations of the Cross there. Hope that you uh, will enjoy your time here. I'm sure you will. Our Lady has many graces for you today. So... Uh, sure. Sure, uh, many people may not even be aware of the significance of October 13th. Maybe even show them the old movie. Even the, the old movie is, is, still has many good merits to it. Um, I think they do. Yeah. And you can even find it online, to tell you the truth. It's on YouTube, I think, in ten parts. Yeah, the old Warner Brothers movie. Not that I encourage everybody to go to YouTube, but if you go there to, to um, watch that, I think you'll find it to be very, very edifying. Although in the movie that doesn't say exactly, Our Lady said, God wishes to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart. The movie doesn't say that. For some reason, they didn't correctly translate that or say that in the movie. But, you know, Our Lady, when she came, when she showed the children the vision of hell in July of 1917... After showing them the vision of hell, the children were frightened. She says, in order to save souls from hell, which you just saw, God wishes to establish, God wishes to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart. Not Our Lady is asking for it, but God is asking to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart. So, devotion to our Immaculate Heart 
in one sense can be seen in another way as consecration to our Immaculate Heart. Okay, well, we'll go over there to the bookstore right now and we'll, we'll bless them for you. We'll start, we'll end with a prayer here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We just ask our lady in a special way for all the graces that she wishes to give to you all here on your visit, trusting in her maternal love and protection as we pray. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. And through the maternal mediation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, may Almighty God bless you and keep you, may he show his face to you and have mercy on you, may he turn his countenance toward you and grant you his peace. May the Lord bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.